Good evening. My name is Francisco Aragon, and I direct Letras Latinas, the literary initiative at the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies. I want to take a moment to acknowledge who has made tonight possible. Our thanks to Red Hen Press for hosting us on their StreamYard platform, with a particular shout out to Toby Harper and Monica Fernandez. I also want to recognize our co-presenters, the Creative Writing Program at Notre Dame and Adelante ND, Notre Dame's Latinx Staff and Faculty Association. My thanks to Adelante's president, Paloma Garcia Lopez, for adopting Subduction, the novel we're engaging with today, their first, their book club this term, for their book club this term. I also want to take a moment to thank Letras Latinas's cadre of benefactors. The work Letras Latinas carries out would not be possible without their gifts and sustained generosity. One of the pleasures of my work with Letras Latinas is meeting and working with Notre Dame students, especially those who manifest a keen interest in enriching the artistic life of our community both on campus and off. Rebecca Gearhart is one such student. She is a graduate student currently in her second year in Notre Dame's MFA program in creative writing. Last year, during the fall term especially, I witnessed how instrumental she was in bringing writers to the Notre Dame Center for Arts and Culture, Notre Dame's presence in the South Bend community. Specifically, she was active in working on the BRIC reading series, as well as an inter-university undergraduate student reading series. She's also helped with editing fiction for the undergraduate journal Revisions. Her own creative work often delves into issues of identity and anxiety within the Jewish diaspora. Her work has appeared in or is forthcoming in American Cordata, The Hunger, and The Capra Review. Her short story, Splinter, represented American Cordata in the Best Fiction category in the Stack Publishing Awards. Tonight, she will do us the honor of introducing our distinguished guest, Christian Miatis Young, and Rebecca will join me afterwards as we enter into a colloquium with Kristen. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Gearhart. Thank you, Francisco. I read, I read Subduction in one day. I didn't mean to read it in one day, but that's the kind of book Kristen Malaris Young wrote. In the novel, a Latinx anthropologist named Claudia returns to her research in Nia Bay, Washington, where she studies songs and traditional culture of the Macaw people. She returns to this research after learning that her husband and her sister have been having an affair. At times, Claudia longs for the Mexico she feels so separated from, yet she feels compelled to erase herself as a part of the diaspora. She seeks refuge in the Macaw culture she has grown to love over her career, while to the Macaw people she is white, suspicious. As Claudia wades further into the deep of her work, professional and personal lines begin to blur. The subject matter of this novel, of culture clash and what it means to be overtaken or to overtake, is intense and important and unforgiving, but Kristen Milares Young has taken this challenge on and produced something so honest in the way that only truly impactful fiction is honest. In an interview with The Rumpus, Kristen said, recurrence is vital to storytelling, particularly within oral cultures. We repeat things we want remembered. Subduction has a fractal-like quality. It imitates the ebb and flow of the landscape where it is set. The emotional inner lives of the characters track like wave cycles, like lunar cycles, swelling and receding in rhythm with one another. From the beginning, the writing tells the reader, you are in this. From the text, she was merely passing through this world or above one in any case, riding the back of an inland sea where fish were fighting and fucking and occasionally being carried off by nets, their minds naked with terror, a merciless place acidified by the dank exhales of engines, 
Those sea creatures shepherd their young in good faith. Their only end is death, as it is here and everywhere on earth. Those that remain will end in mud picked over by crabs. The entire book is rendered with this visceral intensity and the writing itself calls to mind these early images of the Pacific Northwest landscape. The text reads as if rendered sharp by water and rock and the very land that produced it. I can't say it enough, this book was a haunting pleasure to read. Kristen Milares Young is a prize-winning journalist and author. Her journalism has appeared in numerous places such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Guardian, and she is the former prose writer in residence at the Hugo House. Additionally, Kristen was part of the research team for the Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times multimedia project, Snowfall, the Avalanche at Tunnel Creek. We are very lucky to have her here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Kristen Millares Young. Thank you so much for uh, recognizing, it's such a beautiful thing when a reader uh, see so deeply into your book, uh, into the lunar cycles, which are, recur into the tidal cycles and the wave cycles that have that sine cosine pattern that re recurs in song and in the waves and in the movements between my two characters, Claudia and Peter. I'm deeply grateful uh, to have had such an attuned reader uh, for this conversation. Thank you, Rebecca. I also wanna thank uh, Francisco and Red Hen Press uh, for uh, making this happen. It has been a labor of love as all literary labors are. Um, I am going to read uh, a small section from Subduction, which is about this Latin anthropologist, right? Who brings her damage into a community that has no need of it. And yet her presence catalyzes actions which have been long deferred um, within a family uh, whose mother's name is Maggie. Uh, Maggie has become a hoarder and uh, been diagnosed with dementia during the time that Claudia has been working with her. And uh, Claudia needs the consent of Maggie's son, Peter, who is uh, recently returned to Nia Bay to take care of his mother and also to try to extract some information from her that he has never been able to ask for. And in that sense, Claudia as an interlocutor between the two of them breaks loose truths which had been very long in coming. Uh, however, in this section that I'm going to read, Claudia wakes up into a changed world, a world that's been changed by actions that she's taken when perhaps she was not in a position to offer consent either. Daylight pressed against her eyelids. A bright smear beamed between her glued lashes. Her head was beyond aching. It pulsed. The hangover occupied her entire body, spilling off the bed and pooling onto the floor, filling the room. She tipped her face to the window. Curtains parted onto a view of cloudless view. Her eyes were sticky. So was her mouth. She closed her eyes again. The glare tackled her lids. And from beneath, she saw a different planet, a red world veined with mauve. Birds chirped. A car started. Tires scraped over asphalt. Children shouted in Spanish, and a woman shushed them. A car door slammed. She squeezed her eyes shut scrunching her face. Pain radiated from her temples. Claudia spread her hands on the bed, patting rough folds of cotton. She was naked and alone, but for two crumpled pillows. She reached between her legs. A swamp. Her period? She swiped at her lips and came up with silky black hairs too long to belong to her. Groaning, she turned her back to the window. She was alone now, but she hadn't been. Peter. Claudia tucked both hands between her thighs. She'd had unprotected sex with the son of her best hope for a meaningful qualitative study. Everyone would find out if he felt like making it known and what man wouldn't. She swung her legs off the bed and sat up and her headache expanded like a dying star. A stripe of dirt and flies lined the gray carpet where it tucked into the plastic baseboard. The sound of her own breath echoed in her ears. She was sore. The children outside screamed and laughed. A vacuum bumped around the room next to hers. Sometimes Macaw worked these jobs. Even if they lived off the reservation, they'd talk. She'd have to erase the evidence. She turned her head toward the door. It was not chained. She always chained the door. That meant they'd had sex here, or at least come back here. She fought an image of his face careening into and out of focus above her. Her clothes were doubled over a chair. That's not how she would arrange them. He tidied up. 
craning her neck, she checked the other nightstand. Her keys were stacked next to a full glass of water. Had she driven here? If not, she would be seen walking an exposed and dangerous stretch of highway that had no other purpose this morning but to shame her. If so, she should already be ashamed. And she was. She had just violated every code of ethics she ever agreed to hold sacred, and she did it on a whim, wasting herself. It couldn't be undone. She drained the glass, water running down both sides of her mouth. She would need to make herself presentable. Driving down Front Street was like strolling a promenade. Everyone checked you out, and if there was even a halfway decent chance that you'd been seen, they'd weave their car just a little bit to show it. Claudia stood up to tug the Paisley curtains together, wondering, did he leave them parted on purpose? They shimmied right back into place, loosing a light flurry of dust. Okay, no, he hadn't. She scurried to the bathroom, hiding her ass and avoiding the mirror, and checked the wastebasket. No condom, no shiny wrapper, not even a tiny, torn-off corner. Maybe he flushed them, but that wasn't it, and she knew that already. Claudia faced her reflection. Her shoulders and breasts bore rough red patches. She pirouetted to check her back. On her neck, next to her spine, four bruises bloomed in a row, purple as pansies. Seeing them alarmed her. A shower. First things first. The motel stocked the kind of soap that splits in two when you open the wrapper, and nothing else. It would have to do. Her fingers smelled like cum and cigarettes. She didn't dare take a whiff of her hair. She pulled the curtain and started the water, nearly falling out of the tub when a cold spray sputtered out of the shower head. Then again, cold water was better for washing off semen, a lesson learned while camping with Andrew. Early on in her marriage, she slept under the stars, unafraid, scoffing at tents, hair full of wood smoke, inviting dew. Early on, they zipped their sleeping bags together. Early on, they did all kinds of cheesy shit she used to love. When did she stop being young? When had she become used? Claudia peed herself to keep warm, focusing on the shower, which was almost hot. It would be okay. Everything would be okay. Things would get better the cleaner and emptier she got. She scoured her scalp with shards of soap, moving down her body in brusque circles. The water was cooling. By the time she got to her thighs, it was frigid. She let the icy stream blast her face. Swollen eyes rode her with a long night of hard drinking. With no conditioner, there wasn't much she could do about her hair. The towels were the size of tissues and about the same thickness. She dried her hair with unwise flips of her head, reeling against the sink as her brain sloshed back into place. Scrubbing her teeth at the wet towel corner, she rinsed and spat and searched for flashbacks to reconstruct her night. Kelly Green. Yes, it began by playing pool. His bad break. No, no, no. It began with beers on the beach and the slow creep to Clallam Bay. Amber light in a tumbler, and another, and another, and another. Had she ordered those drinks, or did he bring them to her unasked? She couldn't remember paying for anything but the first round, which she did with Cass in case she got stopped. She saw herself sink the eight ball, watched his face sharpen, his smile lines crystalline as he held the door on their way out. Stars tumbling to her right, <sighs> the passenger seat. Good, she hadn't driven. Warmth on her body, a hand on her throat, her head against the wall. The Mattel clerks call, fuck. They were already famous. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful reading. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually, I have a question that um, I feel like relates to the passage that you, you just read for us. Um, in reading the text, I felt that the moments of spontaneous, unprotected sex mirrored Claudia's own struggles to maintain the ethics of her outsider position within the community. Um, and I was wondering what it was like navigating eroticism between two individuals who were already in a tense framed kind of relationship you know, that had that outside tension? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in so many ways, uh, the interpersonal relationships, despite their need in some ways to be governed by social convention, are not governed by social convention. Um, I wanted to create an artwork that reflected life. And the fact is that sex can be an incredible moment of rupture, which is both violent and also creates an aperture for new understandings and intimacy and connection to occur. 
And it's been so fascinating for me uh, to hear reactions from readers uh, about uh, some of the scenes. Some of them are like, oh, that's so hot. Others are like, oh, that was so violent. It was terrible. And to see the ways in which we're conditioned to understand, accept, or reject uh, the ways in which these two people's bodies found each other and the recurrence of that discovery and the return to it, despite the, rare, the very real damage they're doing to each other every single time. Um, their need, their aloneness, their solitude within their own souls is so great that it overwhelms the damage that they know they're doing to each other, that they know they're doing to themselves by engaging in this relationship, if that's what you can call it. Mm -hmm. And so that impulse, that urgency uh, toward visceral connection is something which is not allowed in our society. Uh, and yet it is the driving force for miscegenation. Um, most, I mean, that's, that's how we're all coming together. Okay. It's not commerce, it's sex, you know? And so there's something about that transgression, um, and the violence of it, which as you mentioned in your beautiful introduction, uh, does echo in the fractal relationship that it has, uh, with the geology of the place as well, that constant grinding pressure, which does lead to, uh, immense, um, shut, you know, shuddering, shattering, moments, um, both culturally and interpersonally and sexually uh, for both of these characters. Thank you, Kristen. Just to give our viewers a sense of where we're going. So we're going to engage in a back and forth Q&A for about, about 15 minutes before Kristen uh, reads another excerpt. My first question for you comes from our Adelante group. And this is from a colleague who herself is an anthropologist. And here's how she frames her question. She says, ethical questions of doing ethnography are at the heart of your novel. Today, anthropologists are expected to follow ethical research methods requiring that those being studied give their consent. The protagonist, Claudia, is said to have engaged in data gathering interviews that masqueraded as conversation. Taking information from others without their knowledge is exploitative, it is stealing. But the phrasing of this passage suggests that the question could be posed to other kinds of work and job relationships. How are personal conversations employed in other creative contexts? How do fiction writers, memoirists, and poets handle this issue in your view? Well, so I really appreciate the attention to the ethics of ethnography, which is very much the driving force of subduction. You know, the truth is that uh, when someone is conducting an interview, uh, they are helping to co-create a documentation of knowledge, which is held in keeping by the person who's being interviewed. Within the case of journalism, people say that they are giving an interview to a journalist because they do not themselves get a copy of that transcript. They do not get uh, a recording of it either. They are entrusting those words to the journalist. And often people um, by uh, unethical or uh, journalists who are sensationalist get burned by you know the, the apex of an emotional uh, moment being quoted rather than uh, a line that may have been more reflective of the studied intent that the interview subject brought to their hours together. In my time as a fiction writer, uh, I'm an investigative journalist and I'm an essayist and I'm a fiction writer. Um, what I found is this, I was on above board at all times, very early on in the process, which began in 2005. So before I was, there was any question, you know, before I had any text to, to share with people uh, from the book, you know, I was saying, I'm writing a novel. This is what I am doing. That is why I'm here. And uh, what I have found though, is that most people um, are starved for interest in their knowledge. They want to be asked about themselves. Mm -hmm. They are so rarely asked about what they know and why it matters. And so most people, when they begin to speak about what they know, quickly lose sight of what they mean to disclose and what they do not mean to reveal. Within a journalistic uh, interview, it is possible for someone to say, now I'm going to go off the record. And people who have been practiced 
in being interviewed by journalists will employ that. And some it's a negotiation often between the interviewer and the interview subject. Mm -hmm. What I have found repeatedly in all of the work that I have done in depth in various communities is that I, as the interviewer, need to remind people again and again why we are there. Because they want to forget. Because the intimacy and need that is tapped into by a conversation about the deepest wisdom that someone has to share makes them forget and forges a connection that goes beyond the framework of an interview. So even though it can be very clear from the outset that this is an interview about this specific subject, the fact is most people, they move in circles mm -hmm. around themselves mm -hmm. and they begin to disclose other details about their family life, other details about their personal history, and those asides tend to be more informative, if you're listening carefully, mm -hmm. than the responses to the actual questions that you're asking. And so the reason that I included that particular phrase uh, was because many people who conduct long-term research work within various communities um, rely on the recurrence of their return to that community to establish trust, to expand the realm of knowledge that someone is willing to disclose. And it's a very delicate dance between expanding that realm of knowledge and constantly reminding them why you were there, what this was going to be used for, and the fact that it will be used in service of a project which may or may not be what they would choose to do with this knowledge. And so um, even if something has been labeled and is consistently reminding in that, you know, the interviewer is consistently reminding someone that that is what they are doing, people want to forget and to bring it up again, which I have done so many times, mm -hmm. is to insert a bit of awkwardness. It can also seem a little bit insulting, like, oh, I know, I know that. I know that I'm being interviewed, right? But, um, but people want to forget. And it really, it saddens me in a lot of ways that uh, so many peoples, and this is not just for this book, but in all of the work that I have done, whether interviewing global CEOs or uh, interviewing, you know, uh, people who are survivors of various kinds of violence, um, so few people have received sustained interest in what they know. And this to me is an indication of a deep depravity in uh, American culture, that we as uh, younger generations have not been practiced in the art of asking and then deeply listening and remembering. And because of that, when you do show that kind of interest in someone else, um, their connection that they feel with you is immediate. And um, even if you've said this is an interview, it becomes a conversation. Thank you. Um, I was... Curious about a certain collision that I saw occurring in the text. Um, and I was wondering the order of the elements in the narrative and how they fell into place, um, specifically in regard to landscape and character, because they seem inextricable to me. Um, they become one at so many times in the text. And I was wondering if one preceded the other or if you developed the idea of landscape and then the characters of Claudia, Peter, and Maggie followed, or if it was the reverse, kind of how, how that worked itself out? Thank you for that question. You know, one of the things about uh, citing a, a novel in an indigenous community is that the idea of indigeneity is you're not from a place, you are of that place. And so place and character are inextricable. Um, an entire culture has evolved uh, in Nia Bay uh, over millennia that was adaptive and reacted uh, to the place in which they found themselves. Uh, and to the extent that the movements between the characters I mentioned, you mentioned fractals earlier. At one point in writing this book, um, I, I'm mean, obviously I was obsessed. I spent you know more than a decade doing it, um, mm -hmm. but I was charting uh, Peter and Claudia's emotional rise and fall. And what I found is that they, uh, were only intersecting at moments of, of ascent and descent. Uh, they very rarely 
um, not ever, except maybe sometimes in sex, even though then there was usually someone uh, who was um, more in control than the other uh, during those moments. Um, they would rarely intersect. And so their patterning of their, um, their rising and falling emotions and action followed a sine cosine um, wave, which is a pattern that you find in waves. It's a pattern you find in sound. It's a pattern that is absolutely redolent, saturated in the surrounding land um, in that territory, which is on the lower, uh, the Northwest tip of the lower 48. And so I had spent so many years going back and visiting, and then I was um, mostly alone for the uh, early years. Um, as the years went by, I had children and began bringing them with me, which was actually really beautiful. Um, so many uh, Macaw uh, families, like family is first. Uh, and so their interest in family is very Latino, actually. It reminds me of Latino communities. Um, and so it was really, it was uh, even more joyful uh, to to be there with my family. But of course, when you're minding to uh, two very small children, you're not as aware <laughs> of everything that's happening around you. You're just trying to make sure they don't like run into the street, you know? Um, and so for those first years, uh, I would spend a lot of time um, walking around by myself. Um, I'd either be outside by myself or inside with tribal members. Um, and you see that in the dichotomies of the book. There are uh, moments of saturation where the landscape is like living and breathing around you and you can kind of feel that hush, you know, which I think is the real power of the book, the sympathetic magic mm -hmm. of the book, you know, um, and, uh, and then you're inside the trailer right? And the TV is on and there's a scanner on. And most of the families that I knew had scanners on all the time because they like to keep track of what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, all of those kind of narrative interruptions uh, mm -hmm. were also uh, very place-based. And yet the sense of the place within the shelter of walls versus being outdoors is very different. Um, so these characters, uh, particularly uh, Maggie and Peter, uh, and Peter's job is an underwater welder, right? He's a commercial diver. And mm -hmm. so his um, his way of being also uh, was very much conditioned uh, by the sea and its ebbs and flows. And his emotional states often feel tidal to me. Um, and Maggie, of course, um, the mask that she has been saving uh, for Peter uh, for many, many decades, you know, um, has, you know, kind of a lunar cycle uh, burned into it. Um, and so her kind of hope waxing and waning over the long period of time that she was waiting for her son to come back uh, is also related to nature and yet is something within her woman's body, right? And so if we're paying attention to the body in place, especially as women, um, we will find that connection if we allow ourselves to feel it and not be divorced uh, from the truth of our animal body, our animal being, um, and the fact of um, that we ourselves are the product of a natural environment that in urban areas we basically ignore. Thank you, Kristen. I think we're ready to hear our second excerpt. And when, we, when we're done, I have a question for you. Oh, great. Um, so this section, that I'm going to read uh, is from Peter's perspective. Um, the book uh, moves between chapters that have these intersecting moments um, and uh, narrated by Claudia and then Peter and kind of an A, B, A, B uh, rhythm. Okay. And here, uh, Claudia begins to daylight information that Peter doesn't know if he's ready to handle. Claudia did not answer him Instead, she undid the knot of another bag, pulling from it four blankets, the Peter, the kind Peter remembered from every couch of his childhood, but last saw at truck stops, thick velour and royal blue and crimson, covered with airbrushed wolves howling at the moon and eagles with outstretched wings. His mother's bed had nothing but a thin duvet with no down comforter inside it. She didn't like to sleep hot, she said, but it bothered him how she stinted herself while keeping blankets for beds that had never been made, never been slept in. She was a goner. 
She had been long gone by the time he got back to her. He didn't know what he was hoping for when he bagged this shit in grief and desperation, troubled by her repeating mind, her addiction to worthless household items, the acquisition of one, then the other, then the other, never satisfied with what she had, always fixated on the next one coming down the pike. Kind of like his serial fuckery. But there was no mass grave of lovers to shame him. And yet here was hers, disinterred. Let me talk to her. Claudia wiped her palms on her knees. This shit has to go. Claudia leaned in the doorway between the living room and the kitchen, where his mother had surrounded herself with a heaping bag of flour, a can of baking powder, a large cup of water, and a shaker of salt. Beneath the old dish towel she used to cover the mixing bowl, batter was rising, pushing the faded gingham into a conical dome that sloped off to one side. She was about to make Indian tacos, his favorite for the night his dad died, before he smelled batter and oil and blood as one the memory a warm penny in his mouth, always. He had never been able to eat fry bread since, never been able to go to a powwow in some distant city when he was missing home without staggering out, tears streaming from the oil and flour smell hovering over the fairgrounds, the stray ladies in the parking lot thinking he was just another sad drunk who shouldn't be around children. A shiver in his chest shuddered up to a tick in his left eyelid. He couldn't stand a repeat of this morning's battle. A hard one calm kept his mom in its grip while the drugs lasted. Serene, she moved like she was in water, moving from counter to counter, humming. Peter stepped into the damp cold, leaving the door open as he braced himself with deep gulps. The more he inhaled, the more air he wanted, his chest heaving, lungs singed by his struggle to give himself what he needed. He could not get enough, could not fill himself up, but he kept trying, bending over to prop himself against the trailer, huffing clean mist until his teeth buzzed. Calm down, he commanded. Calm down! Try not to hug himself in case the neighbors were watching. He boxed the air and spun a tight circle like he was exercising. Any man need to step out and get it sweat sometimes. And after he'd thrown enough punches to heat himself, running in place, feet thrumming like the wings of a hummingbird, he was glad to find a forsaken cigarette behind his ear, and that burnt taste was never so good. He took it once, twice, three times, the ember hurrying toward the filter. Now he was relaxed. Now he could listen. Mine never turns out that stretchy. Claudia was such a kiss ass. His mother must be pulling the batter apart. Never need fry bread. It's a mistake. There was a thump of dough falling onto a floured countertop, like the old days. I'll remember that. Claudia didn't sound fake like he thought she might. Maybe she could learn something. But then, so, Maggie. He heard bubbling. His mother always dipped a wooden spoon in the oil to make sure it was hot enough, and her silence. She could wait anyone out, a trick Peter used on his bosses, who filled his lengthy pauses with chattering, depleting their own power, unused to his peculiar form of non-response, which could be mistaken for politeness. Claudia cleared her throat. <clears throat> so, Maggie, I was just thinking about the wonderful things you've been gathering over the years. I couldn't help but notice that they seemed like gifts. Did she say gifts? Claudia's voice was softer. He backed toward the door, cocking his head to one side. The first piece of fry bread went into the cast iron with a frenzied rush of hot froth. The sweat that had risen and vanished from his forehead was replaced, replenished by a line of beads across his brow. Stay put. His heart was beating. Stay put. I've seen those kinds of gifts before. At that potlatch we attended on the Quilly Reservation. Remember? Another ball of dough sent the oil into his fury. You had to admire the sheer custodiness of women. They were squared off now, but his mother had pulled out her stoic act and was quiet. The smell of fry bread was sucking out the door and glomming onto him. His heart ricocheted around his chest, sweat running down his cheeks. His back against the wall, he slid down, covering his eyes, keeping his ear as close to the door jam as he could stand, turning his head every once in a while to catch a fresh breath. He heard a paper towel tear. The bubbles were still, oil dripping. He imagined the fry bread being lifted onto a plate, soaking the paper. Saw blood, too, the stain spreading across his mind. Were you planning a potlatch? Claudia's voice was sweet. Were you planning an India party for, for Peter? Did you want to have a giveaway to pass on some things, like maybe his Indian name and some family songs? He heard a creaking wheeze, shattered coughs, a suppressed wail. Peering over his right shoulder, palm pivoting on the dirty concrete, he saw the dark crown of Claudia's head bent over his mother's small coiled braid, saw her hands pat his mother's heaving back, 
saw his mother encircle this stranger like she was a boy, like she was saved from drowning. The two of them sobbing together, Claudia, that pantomiming cunt. The two of them sobbing together and him outside, dying alone. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, my next question from an Adelante member is the following. Although Claudia was Latina, she only mentions it once to the Macaw family and references it in her thoughts of her mother leaving Mexico. Was this intentional? I appreciated that her I appreciated that she was not a stereotypical Latina. However, there wasn't a lot of cultural identity in the story. Can you talk about this a bit? So, you know, Claudia's backstory is that she was a product of a white father and a Mexican mother. Um, her mother sent her away from uh, their town in the Baja when she was quite young, in part because Claudia had been misbehaving with boys. And so her mother felt that she was going to bring shame onto the family and uh, tried to find another way uh, to um, have her taken care of uh, while protecting the reputation of her younger sister who remained in Mexico. Uh, during that time, her mother was also mm -hmm. suffering from cancer and was on her deathbed. And so she was also arranging for her daughter to be cared for in a culture that she felt would be more receptive uh, to the kind of woman that Claudia was becoming. Now, that trauma, the trauma of being sent away and shamed uh, by one's own mother uh, was something that I think stayed with Claudia to the extent that she doesn't even uh, speak Spanish to herself in her mind. Mm -hmm. um, she has completely adopted uh, English as her language, which is something that happens to so many peoples who come to the United States. Uh, the trauma of the world that they left behind uh, stays with them. And it can be triggering for some people to return to their birth language, their mother tongue, knowing that within it contains all of the elements of the situation which sent them into diaspora in the first place. So there is a there's that where she's uh, given up her birth language uh, in order to assimilate into this country mm -hmm. and to protect herself from the memories that it contains. Uh, there's also the fact that uh, we all know that assimilation to the United States is a long trajectory toward whiteness. And that whiteness and that uh, trajectory is going to be uh, something that is rewarded. People, it is only now, really, uh, that we are as a community uh, being seen in all the vagaries and complexities of our identities and perhaps valued for those. But the fact is, uh, non assimilation is punished relentlessly, socioeconomically, in every way possible, um, having an accent. Uh, speaking in public in, uh, you know, the, any language except the, you know, official language of the United States, um, uh, predicating anything above work, for example, is something that is highly, dis you know, looked down upon in our culture and punished. Uh, one of the things that's always really uh, impressed me about so many of the Native communities that I have encountered um, in the process of writing this book and as a journalist is that, you know, they will often take days and days to attend ceremonies. And if a job is not down with that, they'll quit. You know, they will do something else rather than sacrifice what they know is important uh, to a professional environment. Claudia is someone who has again and again chosen a career which does not value her as a person, instead only values her level of production. And I think that's something that many of us in the United States have experienced, that our personhood, even if we are writing as writers, even if we are showing up and claiming our full ethnic identities, um, our personhood is not what is valued, it's our production which is valued. And so the self erasure which is required to meet those standards of production mm -hmm. inevitably uh, leads to a kind of uh, forgetting, a, a, an amnesia, uh, and a passing um, mm -hmm. to the extent that it is, uh, you can say it's a choice, but it's a choice made under duress. Mm -hmm. It's a choice made um, with all of the support of the economy and our society to continually um, relinquish that which does not serve capitalism, right? 
And so uh, within even her, um, you know, academic environment um, in which, you know, she is being tasked with going into communities and bringing back her observations, uh, the truth is, is that her personhood within those observations is not necessarily valued either. She's supposed to create a disembodied objective um, knowledge. And what is that? All knowledge is subjective. All knowledge is embodied. Um, so because of what she does, because of where she was, uh, the, the mechanism by which she left her birth country and the marriage that she chose uh, to be in, for all of those reasons, Claudia has engaged in a decades-long process of self-erasure. Mm -hmm. um, it's even more uh, poignant, I think, when she's in this community because there, there's a lot of um, Latinos, you know, hanging out on uh, in Nia Bay. You know, there are a lot of uh, mixed race couples and with children who are both, you know, Chicano and um, and Macaw, and um, there is a possibility there uh, for this cultural hybridity. But Claudia has been made so brittle, has been calcified by all these years of self denial that she's not able to embrace what's possible. And instead, she feels like she has to choose. And that binary, that idea of a binary, is the product of coming through the educational system of this United States. Thank you. Rebecca? Thank you. Um, so one thing I was curious about was the way that the book is framed with a kind of subversion of the traditional family structure. Um, in the beginning, we're introduced to the conflict between Claudia's, with Claudia's sister and her husband. And at the end, we see Claudia facing the question of whether to raise this child on her own or not. Um, and I was wondering like, how you see these familial relationships in the context of subduction's larger conversations about overtaking and collision between cultures and people. Once you feel broken, it's really hard to choose wholeness, even if your heart wants that, even if you know you need something, it can be very hard to allow the vulnerability which would create the conditions for connection. And that is one of Claudia's greatest sustained failings. She has been so burned in the past by any disclosures that she's made. She's been so um, isolated in her own psyche, that she's not able to open up in any way and show up as her true self. And as a result of that, she's not able to accept the very real friendships and possibilities that are being offered to her. Um, that is something that I see is true for a lot of people who've been traumatized in diaspora. Um, there is a, a need to, once you have kind of, um, chosen independence and separation from birth culture mm -hmm. in order to uh, find a way for um, to have economic acceptance or cultural acceptance, it can be very difficult. And indeed, it's often punished for anyone to then after that show up as their whole selves. So that wholeness, uh, which is something that she do so desperately craves, is the very thing that she forecloses she forecloses it, not the macaw. It's her. Um, I think you've answered this next question. I mean, your your comment about hybridity and how you you have children who could be half macaw, half Chicano. I think I think I know the answer to this question. But this is what another Adelante member wanted to know. Specu this is a speculative question. Speculative question: Would a macaw family normally accept a child such as Claudia's? Would they pass down their traditions and customs to it? You know, I think it's hard to kind of condition anything with normally, right? Because every family is distinct. Um, what I can say is that having attended, you know, potlatches and talk with uh, people who were in, uh, who were there, um, I spoke with, um, you know, people who were born in Mexico and attending a potlatch, and they have a, a child with um, a cop person, and that child. Um, will be the inheritor of a song and mm -hmm. is participating in the culture. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's really possible is when when uh, Claudia has basically um, 
try to avail herself of all the opportunities that are possible within white culture of the United States, right? In so doing, she also was struggling with um, the patriarchal expectations of her birth culture and trying to break free of those and struggling with how to figure out how do you break free of the suppression of women's independence, which is true within uh, Catholic dominated patriarchal Latino cultures, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you break free from that while also not jettisoning the rest of it? You know, how do you pr practice that selective agency over what you keep and what you leave behind? And so she does it badly, right? She just chooses. She chooses the binary. I, she leaves it all behind, right? So that she can be let in. Um, what I have seen uh, in uh, various uh, other families uh, is uh, there are possibilities for that hybridity, which is encouraged and sustained and um to the extent, though, that there is a uh, something that's normal or typical, I would say it's different for every family. You know, um, some people accept, you know, outsiders coming in. Others would really prefer that, you know, their intermarriages occur with other tribal members from other places. Um, and you see that in Maggie, you know, mm -hmm. who's immediately like, oh, I've got some people I could set you up with. Peter's like, I'm not here to make babies, <laughs> you know. Uh, and um, And so, you know, it's hard to say like one thing is typical or normal and the other is not. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that they're all reacting to the same pressures, but in different ways. And um, I have found uh, even within a single family, various peoples will take on um, different roles or responsibility for being the cultural stewards for their family. And so you can see a family where you have one uh, member who is extremely active within uh, their ceremonies and within their community and, you know, leading uh, pra dance practices for Macaw Days or for their potlatches or for their, you know, naming ceremonies. And then you have another family, another family member, same family, maybe the same, even same generation who's not involved at all. Right. Mm -hmm. So even within the same families, there are people who practice uh, differently uh, mm -hmm. their way of being. And just like being Latino, the fact that, you know, uh, someone doesn't adhere to all elements of their birth culture or whatever the pan Latino culture that people believe that we're all part of, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't make them any less Latino in some ways, mm -hmm. you know, like in the same way that, you know, um, I speak Spanish, other people may not, people who Latinos who don't speak Spanish are still Latino, you know, and the idea of trying to um, categorize people as being more who they are based on this performance of identity is extremely problematic, both within indigenous cultures and also within Latino culture. Thank you. Becca? Um, well, we actually have a question from the audience. Um, I'm so torn by the ending. Can we expect a sequel? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I thought about it. I miss them. I miss Peter. I miss Claudia. I miss Maggie. You know, um, I. I would like to see their child kind of uh, grow up. Um, I'm so interested to um, learn more about them by spending more time with them. But one of the things I was trying to do in this book is to complicate the need for resolution that we often impose on literatures in which we provide a sense of closure, which is not true to life. The fact is this collision of diaspora and indigeneity is ongoing and there has not been resolution. Our work is unfinished. You know, our work of, of becoming uh, and being in, in relation to each other is not yet finished. And so to create um, that kind of Oprah redemptive arc was something that I very much refused to do. And it cost me years, you know, because people wanted that. People wanted, um, they wanted clarity in what was happening with them. They wanted, you know, they wanted that storybook romantic ending. <laughs> but what I did want was a sense for each of the characters that what they had just been through had transformed their lives in some way. Mm -hmm. And that their that transformation may have been wrought in different uh, fashions in each of their lives. And yet what we have just witnessed as readers was transformative. Even if we don't know what exactly is going to happen, uh, they have been changed. And that change is something they'll be carrying forward into their lives. My choice to leave it as it was, uh, was very much um, deliberate, defended, <laughs> defended because, you know, agents wanted me to change it. Presses wanted me to change it. Not Red Hen. I appreciate that about Red Hen Press. Mm -hmm. They saw the beauty and the art uh, of the book as it was. Um, 
But when I think about um, creating that resolution, I think it's false. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are still, I mean, we're, we're using a three act structure that was, you know, codified by dead white men, you know, and the fact of McCall stories, for example, they go on and on, you know, and there often isn't resolution and there are strange digressions, mm -hmm. you know, and those digressions, those recurrences, the lack of resolution is, is indigenous to the area, you know? So to the extent that I wanted to break away from um, Chekhov, who I actually kind of punk a little bit because there in the beginning, um, you know, Peter is furious that he stashed his gun in his truck, right? And Chekhov's like, if you put a gun in the first act, it has to go off by the third act. And I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, you know, <laughs> ha, uh, but, that's funny. I've never said that out loud in public before, but I had little, I had little moments like that, literary moments for myself, you know, that were me winking a little bit at the ideas uh, that I was subverting in, through the structure of the book. So no, no sequel. Thank you. How about so, another question from one of your, one of your cohorts. Um, so uh, piggybacking off of that, maybe a little bit actually. Uh, you talked a little bit about the research that you conducted, and I know that the research was extensive for this project. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it was like to transition to the writing process after spending so much time on the research and how, how you began that process of writing and starting to put these things together. So I did something that I don't recommend for my students, which is that I researched for two years without ever writing. I just read. And part of that is because, you know, uh, as, as an undergraduate, um, I had spent a lot of time, uh, you know, thinking about um, indigenous communities throughout South America. My uh, field of specialty was history and literature of Latin America at Harvard. So I spent a lot of time reading primary source documents, you know, really thinking about these moments of contact throughout South America. But then, as we know, with an academic environments, your specialty is your specialty. So when I then began to really think about uh, US-based indigeneity, um, I found myself uh, confronting vast ignorance, which was my own. And it's also cultural, okay? And this, con this country suffers from uh, genocidal amnesia uh, about indigenous cultures, which are ongoing living and being sustained today by resilient members uh, of tribes, both recognized and unrecognized. Um, so I felt that I had to read for years. Um, that being said, I was reading a lot. I read everything that had been written by, for, and about uh, Macaw people that I could find, which was a lot. Um, I was also looking at uh, the larger uh, sweep of um, oppression uh, that was perpetrated by the federal government, by state governments, by every government that I could find uh, that related to uh, you know tribes, and especially uh, in basically throughout the United States. I mean, everywhere, everywhere, unfortunately. It's um, an oft repeated story. And I was also, um, as I said, going back, visiting, talking with people, um, interviewing folks, um, recording the interview. I have a weird thing that I can do where I can kind of on a laptop, um, I can transcribe an interview as I'm like having it, a conversation as I'm having it. And that helps remind people like real quick you know, cause it's right in front of you. You can hear me, you can see me do it. You know, um, not all of them were like that. And some of the conversations were more extemporaneous, you know, and I didn't have any kind of uh, device. And the idea of creating a record is something that I plumb a lot uh, within, uh, through Claudia's perspective. Uh, you know, she has, um, her, her interview subject, Maggie, denies her, uh, after years of allowing uh, recordings, denies her the ability to record the conversations in part because she tells her, you're gonna need to do it the way that we do it, which is by listening, which your kind has trouble doing, which is true. Uh, and so um, that kind of knowledge production uh, took years. And I have to say, you know, when I really did begin to write, um, it was hard, it was hard knowing uh, how much I would have to allow to speak, uh, how, how I would have to allow all this, this body of knowledge that I spent years building um, be represented by small details, um, by a feeling, you know, by a tone, by the register even of the text. And that trust to allow for ambiguity, to not name everything that I had learned, to not even attach a bibliography to it. You know, um, I mean, I wanted to. Right. I read so, God, just, um, 
And yet, when you are writing after a long period of research, um, if you try to show everything that you know, you will kill the story. Mm. You know, you will it will sink under the weight of your you know pedantic approach. Um, and so, to the extent possible, I had to put all of that research to the side, you know, and just try to follow these people and figure out who they were. So, part of the issue that I had is that I actually started the text a little bit too early in uh, Claudia's life, and so there actually had been um, how many pages was it? A hundred? I cut the first hundred pages of the book. I cut almost everything I wrote in grad school, which was devastating to me because I had been a journalist who had been writing two or three stories a day sometimes and seeing all of those words get into print, seeing all the impact immediately. And to realize that it was not my time that was precious, but the yield uh, of the book was in its artistry. And then if I had to allow uh, for what in other contexts could seem like wasted time, uh, if I had to allow for that possibility and and to and to welcome it, you know, um, that was very, very hard for me. And I was very hard on myself about that too. Even now talking about it, it makes me like kind of like bunch up my shoulders, you know, um, because I had always been efficient. Um, and writing fiction is for me is not an efficient process. It's not about efficiency. In fact, trying to impose efficiency on the process of writing fiction is letting capitalism into my creative process. <laughs> and who needs that? You know, um, to some degree, uh, there's, I hate to, to cop to this, um, but uh, I did understand uh, the iceberg theory uh, from Hemingway much better uh, after revising this book. I had always understood it as an analytical tool that, um, you know, looking into a story and seeing that the grace and beauty of the iceberg is not from what you can see, but from the bulk of it that moves beneath the water. Mm -hmm. And I had understood it in that way. And that was helpful. But really, it's a it's a craft tool. Because what you have to do is lop off the iceberg at the waterline, you know, but that movement still haunts the text. And so everything that you take out is still there. It's there in the emotional intensity, which remains, because once you've entered something in midstream, it's all there, the complexity, the nuance is all still, you spent years developing it. And maybe you cut all this, you know, this backstory, you know, that would explain it, but readers don't need to be explained to. They intuit mm -hmm. things and allowing them to intuit, leaving room for the intellect and emotion of the reader to come into the text uh, was something that, a pretty extensive, ruthless revision process that went over 20 drafts um, led me to. <laughs> I, have a, I have a final question, which is related to what you've been saying, because one of our Adelante members said, I found myself wanting to meet Claudia's sister, yet we don't get to know her relatives that hurt her. So I'm wondering what you're describing. It sounds like there were outtakes. There were there's. It sounds like in your project, there were. I'm here. I'm speculating. You can tell me if I'm barking up the wrong tree. It sounded like perhaps you wrote pages of of characterization of Claudia's sister, of her ex-husband, and maybe you maybe you went through that process, but in the end, it did not end up in the book. But you had to go through that process to get where you want to go. So I'm asking you, or I'm asking for this for this questioner, is there anything you might share that didn't make it into the book about Claudia's sister? Well, the thing is, if we were to see this story narrated by Claudia's sister, it would be completely different. And the truth is that the people want, I even put this in the book, people want to believe the stories they're given, even if they distrust the teller. Claudia is not a reliable narrator, okay? Mm. She's not. She just isn't. Even though we have access to her deepest, darkest interiority, she doesn't even understand herself or why she, she does what she does, right? So then to trust her, uh, her reckoning of what's happened is to accept um, something that a very damaged, traumatized, remorseful, and, um, and, and angry woman is, is telling herself. And we all know that we all rationalize the things that happen in our lives in order to make sense of them. 
right? So we know that we all do that. And yet when we read something, when we hear a story from someone's perspective, we want to believe it so much. If we were to tell the story through Maria's perspective, I'm sure it would look very, very, very different. But the truth is, especially given our culture's focus on labor mobility, mm -hmm. that's what's so different about mm -hmm. going onto Macaw territory versus being in like an urban environment, for example. In Macaw territory, family's there, you know? They're there. They are there. When we meet people in academic environments, they are totally deracinated from their communities, often mm -hmm. from their culture, from their social networks, everything that made that person has been left behind and all you get is the person. You don't get to meet the sister. You don't get to meet the mom. You don't see where they were born. You know, you don't see any of those things. And that is the truth of becoming an American as an immigrant. Not only are we, do we deracinate ourselves in order to avail ourselves of the opportunities of this country, but in so doing, we immediately upon stepping foot onto this territory become a settler. And that is hard to reckon, right? Moving from the sympathetic narrative of the immigrant story, my family survived, we kept going, we remade ourselves again and again to recognizing the reality that when you remake yourselves in America, you're doing so on native land. It's something that's hard to take. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with some of Rebecca's other questions at our colloquium tomorrow. Great. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you to Red Hand Press, Adelante ND, and the Creative Writing Program in collaborating with Latas Latinas on this memorable evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you.